It's a pleasure to be here today uh, to return to my homeland of New England. And I'd also like to acknowledge being on the land of the many first peoples of this area. So many of you are familiar with what archaeology is. It's how we learn what we learn about the past. And I'm an archaeologist. But I'm an archaeologist, but I haven't done archaeology in the field in the last 14 years. And the reason for this is really at the heart of today's presentation, that over the last almost 30 years, I have been doing archaeology, but in a changing landscape, a landscape in which how we do indigenous-related heritage and why we do it has been changing dramatically. There's also increasing recognition that how we define heritage, both in terms of its intangible and tangible aspects, is something that we have had to pay a lot more attention to than in the past. And then finally, what has really been driving me in the last uh, decade is this notion that we need to do archaeology for the benefit of people. And if we're doing the archaeology of indigenous peoples, their interests have to be foremost. And so therefore, what I'm working in is really in the realm of human rights and social justice. And when we're talking about intellectual property, when we're talking about human rights, this is really at the core of in indigenous heritage research. Uh, it's unavoidable. Um, in terms of having to pay and needing to pay close attention to this. And let me start with, with a definition, because we frequently talk about heritage, but heritage means different things to different people in different contexts. Here is my definition of heritage. And as you will see, it's a very broad uh, definition, one that incorporates both the tangible and intangible elements. Uh, ranging from material culture, that is the, 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 the items of everyday archaeology, to stories and, st and songs and places and relations with non-human beings and much more than that. And that all of these are vital to an individual or a community's identity and worldview and history and well-being. So there's a lot at stake here when we're talking about indigenous heritage. But one of the big problems that I've been dealing with, with along with my colleagues is this question, does everyone have equal access to, does everyone benefit from research in uh, and on their heritage? And the answer is no. And this leads me to giving you the punchlines of this talk right now. And I think as we go forward, you'll see how and why these five points are so important. And the first is that Indigenous heritage is not public domain, although that seems to be the trend, that there are no more, more real Indians, and therefore their heritage is available to everyone for any reason, whether it's Hollywood, whether it's commercial products. The second is something I've already alluded to, and that is that access to and benefits from, and so on, uh, one's own heritage is a basic human right. And that's essential for a variety of reasons. A third is that indigenous peoples have received the least benefit of all of the research that's been conducted on their heritage. And this has uh, resulted in uh, a variety of economic, spiritual, and, and cultural losses and harms. What's also important to recognize in this changing landscape is that Heritage-related projects, archaeological projects that are directed by communities challenge the colonial structure, challenge the legacy of scientific colonialism that has long permeated archaeology. And it can do this without compromising the integrity of archaeological research. And finally, um, for a long time now, I have been at the nexus of Western and indigenous worldviews and practices. And it's a very, very uncomfortable place to be. These tensions, however, are really driving forces. And they force us not to be complacent. It, that we have to react and we have to do something when we find ourselves in these uncomfortable but very uh, important situations. Why is 
engaging with indigenous peoples and working to protect indigenous heritage so challenging? Well, let me just give you a few reasons. And the first is that worldviews may be fundamentally different than those of Western society. And in, in the Western society uh, uh, regime, we are often looking at basic dichotomies of nature versus a culture, for example. And yet in many indigenous societies, and I'm careful not to essentialize here, but in many indigenous societies, these dichotomies do not exist. So the natural and so-called supernatural world are one and the same, which means that ancestral spirits are here right now. Uh, the same thing in terms of time. There may not be the usual conception of past, present, and future. Again, these may fold into each other. And relating to this then is the fact that certain objects that we normally see as inanimate may be living. And when we're looking at, and this is from Northern Australia, when we're looking at Namagon, the, the lightning man, from an indigenous perspective, this is not a representation of that being. This is that actual being, and that being is embodied in this, uh, this rock painting. This also explains why there may, may be, for many indigenous peoples, no difference, no fundamental difference between the authentic, the, the real uh, object, and a replica of it. And this is especially the case for um, ceremonial objects. And then finally, we're looking at issues that affect real people. And this is very much the case with, with the ancient one, uh, Kenwick Man, recently repatriated. And what is so problematic about Kenwick Man over his um, recent history following his discovery is that he lies at this intersection between science, politics, and religion. And these are three formidable, formidable realms. But for indigenous peoples, there is much at stake here in terms of what happens to him. And you couple all of this with the power imbalance that has existed historically between indigenous peoples and archaeology, and we see how challenging uh, the situation can become. The Society for American Archaeology is the largest organization of archaeologists in the world. And their code of ethics begins with this first principle of stewardship. And if you look at this, 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 this is just part of, of, of the first principle. What is, is written here is, is commendable. It's something I've, I strongly support in terms of you know, the nature of the archaeological record, how unique it is. It's re irreplaceable and so on. And it advocates a position of stewardship, that archaeologists are stewards of the past. We care for it for other peoples. But notice this one uh, phrase that I've highlighted, that stewardship is for the benefit of all peoples. And this takes a universalist view that does not acknowledge that some peoples have a different, a closer relationship to some parts of that archaeological record and should have you know, some sort of special recognition, special rights in this regard. There's also other problems with, with stewardship, and this is also referring to how archaeology in general is, is uh, the role that it has in our society. And the first is that it is not a neutral orientation. It's one that, that foregrounds Western values. The second is that there's only limited accommodation for non-Western perspectives. That is, archaeologists are happy to work with indigenous peoples as long as the archaeologists are the ones who develop the project. And then finally, there are serious concerns about relinquishing control. That is, if you are going to make the process of archaeology more equitable, that means that you as the archaeologist have to give up some degree of control over the, the process, over the projects. And the majority of archaeologists are unwilling to do this because they then have concerns about uh, losing control over a project. Now, the issues that I'm talking about today dealing with heritage are not limited to indigenous peoples. That heritage uh, is something that all peoples have, of course, in different ways, um, in different formats. Uh, whether we look at uh, these objects in the British Museum as the Elgin marbles or the Parthenon marbles, depending upon the term you use, you are making a political statement in terms of who has rights to those, whether they should be returned to Greece or not. There's also concerns about nationalists versus individual community interests. 
in museums and in other contexts. And one of the main areas where many of these issues pl are playing out, and this comes back to the point about indigenous heritage often being seen as public domain, is in the realm of appropriation and commodification of heritage. And this is something that is rampant with uh, indigenous people's heritage, especially so here in North America. And this may take many different forms. And I'm not talking about commercial products per se here, although I could, I could give you examples of probably two or 3,000 commercial products based on indigenous heritage. But here's an example of, of the recreation of Northwest Coast masks, such as you see in the bottom corner, by Brian Youngin out of Nike basketball shoes. This is a very creative endeavor. But it challenges you know, the, the authenticity, as it were, of classic Northwest Coast designs. These are uh, traditional Inuit snow goggles. And over on, on the side, you'll see plastic replicas based on those that sell for 40 pounds uh, in the UK. And I was with an Inuit colleague, and I showed him this. And he was dumbfounded that someone did this with his culture. There's the appropriation of, of sacred places, you know, so-called medicine wheels, as you see on the top, where Lakota man is, is, is photographed praying in the early 20th century. Many New Age groups now go to these and take them apart and put them back together to absorb the energy that may be there. They also leave offerings, as you see around on, on the fence on the bottom. Uh, traditional foods are being reintroduced, often with little recognition of their origins. And we find other kinds of appropriation, such as the band No Doubt, uh, with their uh, music video Looking Hot, which is all about cowboys and Indians. Uh, you can no longer find this video online because it was taken down at the, at, in response to uh, a very harsh criticisms of the band for this kind of appropriation. Uh, and if you go to Germany, uh, you'll find these German Indian clubs where white folks dress up as Indians. Uh, they are enamored with Native American life. Now, there are many, many examples that I could give you, but what I want to point out is that oftentimes these uses of someone else's heritage is unwelcome, inappropriate, or downright harmful. And sports teams is, is, is one, you know, one very uh, obvious example of this. And, um, sorry. And these are some of the, the, the potential harms uh, when we're looking at the appropriation of indigenous heritage. You know, you lose respect for the sacred. Uh, special items once associated with particular societies, like a nookshuk in the Arctic, are now commonplace as a result of the 2010 Winter Olympics that use them as their, their official logo. And you have re reproductions replacing tribal art. Uh, the bottom, by the way, is Miss Canada of 2008 wearing a buckskin bikini, which to my knowledge is not traditional garb. Uh, and by the way, she is of Iranian descent. So appropriation commodification is something that we find with all people's heritage. And some people, uh, some people market, some people want to share their own heritage, which is their decision. But this, is ten this tended, tends not to be the case with, with Native Americans. And for them, they are the peoples who have had the least control over their heritage. They are the ones that have had very little benefit of all of the research uh, that's been done on their society. Now, the issues that I'm pointing out here are things that all of us need to be aware of, whether we're academics, whether we're policymakers, or whether we are consumers. And this becomes evident when we look at some of these examples. You know, today you can uh, submit a cheek swab and, and get your DNA tested and figure out where you come from. But for many indigenous peoples, this is a concern because finding out about their heritage can challenge such things as land claims. These are examples of traditional rock art, as you see here, being used for wine labels. So this is, this is another area where consumers want to, you know, should be aware of the products that they are buying, you know, may appropriate or not someone else's heritage. On the top right, this is a wine label for a, uh, a First Nations uh, or Native American um, 
uh, owned uh, uh, winery in British Columbia. So this is their heritage that they are using on their wine label. Uh, new, new challenges are emerging with online repositories and, and digital information being available. Um, the 3D scanning and printing revolution uh, exemplifies many of the concerns here in terms of do you have rights to reproduce in a variety of forms, you know, someone else's heritage. And I could go on and on, but the point is that these are kinds of uses of someone else's heritage that at the very least can be problematic, uh, in many cases can be very harmful for a variety of reasons. So where do we go from here? I mean, obviously, the first step is recognizing that there is the potential for harm, the potential for misunderstanding, the potential for inappropriate use. Let me give you two examples of how I personally have tried to uh, move forward with, with those challenges. And the first is, as Bob has already pointed out, the realm of indigenous archaeology, something that I've been very involved with for the last 25 years. And this is um, a big change in archaeology. It's a new flavor of archaeology, as it were. And it's one that is oriented to making archaeology more responsible, more relevant, not only as an academic practice, but to give indigenous peoples a tool, a set of tools that they could use however they see fit on their heritage, but also for other people's heritage. I mean, why shouldn't they be out, uh, in, that is, Native Americans, digging up historic white settler um, uh, encampments and providing their interpretation of, of that exotic way of life? Bob mentioned, uh, you know, that I was, uh, and Tom Andrews came out with the first definition of indigenous archaeology, uh, a very, very simplistic one. Ten years later, I came up with a far more involved one, uh, it was a formidable challenge because in the, in the course of 10 years, indigenous archaeology had blossomed in, into this multifaceted, um, very slippery kind of beast. And so these are um, you know, just a few of the, the ways we now look at indigenous archaeology. You know, it's archaeology that's informed by indigenous sensibilities. Uh, it's one that's based on collaborative ventures. And it's not only benefiting indigenous peoples, but it is broadening the scope of archaeology itself, and that is a very good thing. So this is something I've, I've worked on for a long time and continue to be involved in this realm. It's a very satisfying realm. But this has ver been very much about the process of making archaeology more equitable. So the second thing that I did was to focus more on the products of archaeological or heritage research. And this is through the IPINCH project. And this was an uh, international eight-year um, collaborative project that officially ended last March, and I was the director of it during this time. Our four objectives were these. The first was to basically document, to identify the kinds of heritage issues, particularly in terms of intellectual property, uh, that have proved to be so uh, problematic. The second was to analyze, to figure out how and why these problems did emerge. Third is to generate that deeper, you know, more theoretical, more meta-analytical understanding of these. And then finally, to share our findings with people who need that information to make informed decisions, whether they be indigenous communities or uh, political leaders or the public at large. Uh, a massive team and what was so important about this team is that it was comprised not just of archaeologists, but of cultural anthropologists and ethicists and museum specialists and lawyers and legal scholars and many others. Because when we're talking about heritage, again, it's not just material culture. It is everything else that surrounds material culture. A large portion of our uh, project was devoted to community-based research. And we funded 16 community uh, projects around the world. And you'll see the uh, locations here. And I'll come back to uh, a few examples of those in a moment. Our basic research themes uh, are these. Uh, these are the main themes. We have a lot of other themes. But one was bioarchaeology, DNA, and indigeneity, uh, a hugely important topic. 
Another was commodification of cultural heritage, which I've, I've spoken to you briefly already. Uh, the third is the general realm of community-based heritage research. How do we facilitate that? How do we uh, move that along in a good way? Cultural tourism in a, is another. Um, the legal aspects of cultural heritage is uh, another. And then finally, indigenous research ethics. So we have been very, been very much involved in all of these realms for some time. But to come back to the community-based research, our, in the, our incentive here was to ask the question, what happens when the community is in the driver's seat, when they are making the decisions as to where to go and how to go? And this is, you know, this is my favorite photograph of all time, I think. You know, Geronimo in his Cadillac. And no one is telling Geronimo where to go. And this was you know, really the basis of, of these projects that it was the community who determines what the project would be. That in, some ca in many cases that these are communities already working with some of our team members. So we already had, through the team member, that long-term relationship established. The community decided what methods to use, whether they be focus groups, whether they be interviews, whether they be you know, field data collection. The community decided what research results could be released to the iPinch team for a further study. And this, they also ensured that no sensitive information would leave the community, because this is their information. And they decided what they would share and what they would not. And that, is, that was how we wanted to do this. In terms of the projects themselves, here is a, a snapshot of, of some of them. Um, working with uh, the Arctic Studies Center, um, the Inuvialuit of the Western Canadian Arctic uh, went to the Smithsonian to spend several weeks recording information on traditional clothing and other items taken from, our, taken from their community 150 years ago by Hudson Bay Trader. This is a, a study in repatriation. But the Inuvialuit didn't want these items back. Physically, they wanted the information that they contained back in terms of clothing patterns or muckluck patterns. And those patterns have been reintroduced into the community today in new clothing products. Working with the Saginaw Chippewa of Michigan, uh, the Zebuing Cultural Center wanted to develop a co-management scheme for uh, the, the, the um, Sandalek petroglyphs, which is a very l large rock uh, a panel with carvings on it, as you see here of an archer, that is currently owned by, um, by a park. And the uh, Saginaw Chippewa don't have a key to the gate that surrounds it. So this was a, a project to enable them to have the kind of access that they should. And these, these uh, carvings, which they consider teachings, are still being used today for particular ceremonies. Uh, working in Kyrgyzstan, uh, this was a project in cultural tourism in post-Soviet um, um, era country. And this was a way to ensure that the, the Kyrgyz could showcase their heritage, uh, bring their heritage into the, uh, into the schools in Kyrgyzstan. And it's just an absolutely remarkable project and what they have done for a very little amount of money. One very important project is the Journey Home Project that is a collaboration between the Museum of Anthropology at UBC and the Musqueam uh, and Stolo Nations. And this was to develop protocols for working with human remains uh, in a manner that is acceptable to the First Nations before they are reburied. And this really serves as a model for a scientific study before repatriation. Uh, working with the Moriori off the coast of New Zealand, uh, this was to develop a uh, cultural heritage database uh, to record elders' knowledge before the elders pass, which in this project involved the youth. And, and connecting youth to elders is something that many, or in fact most, uh, Native American societies want very badly. And this woman is pointing to a dendroglyph that is a carved tree in uh, what is considered a sacred grove. And this is an example of, you know, that tree is a living being to this woman. And many of these, these trees are diseased, so the Moriori are recording them while they can 
to preserve this very important information that is, in this case, hundreds of years old. So those are snapshots of a few of our, our community-based projects. But other things that we've been involved in include working to educate universities and funding agencies. And in this case, we had a research ethics conference that was aimed at sharing lessons that we've learned and others have learned to facilitate doing indigenous research with and in many cases for indigenous communities. And many universities are still trying to figure out how do, how do we actually do this? Because universities are not used to working with Native American tribes or other kinds of indigenous organizations. Also working to educate the public, uh, we had a uh, public symposium followed by a workshop on DNA and indigeneity, the changing role of genetics and indigenous rights, tribal belonging and repatriation. And one of the workshop participants was Armin Minthorn, pictured on the bottom on, on the left. And he was the leading spiritualist with the repatriation of, um, of Kennewick Man. In terms of appropriation commodification, uh, we came out with this booklet, Think Before You Appropriate, uh, a guide for creators and de designers. And one of the major uh, tasks that I've had the last couple of years is answering phone calls from reporters who say, have you seen the latest fashion news, such as this, the, the image that you see in the bottom here, uh, a shaman's um, a shaman, uh, sorry, a shaman's uh, sweater design from KTZ, um, which costs about a thousand dollars, and we know who that actual shaman was, and his great granddaughter came forward to say this is totally inappropriate, and this hit new, hit the news worldwide, and KTZ quickly pulled the product, but of course saying the usual, but we were just doing this to honor Native Americans. And so this is one area where fashion designers need to be educated, but also consumers. Uh, but what is also important about this booklet is that it's also being used now by, um, by writers, by musicians, and others who need some advice on how does one go about using, in an appropriate way, indigenous heritage. Uh, this is available on our website, and it's had 10,000 downloads so far. Uh, we've been funding a variety of projects, including a traditional licensing project. And this is a little bit like Creative Commons, where those uh, uh, indigenous groups who are working with uh, the TK licensing can identify how they will allow you to use some aspect of their heritage uh, using these symbols. And again, this is like Creative Commons. And this is something that seems to be working very well in terms of public education and allowing their heritage to be used, but in an appropriate way. These and, and much more is available on our website. I encourage you to go take a look. Uh, even though the project ended last year, we are continuing to maintain and add to our website. And you'll find uh, at this point, we have 100 videos on all aspects of iPension, ranging from, you know, from archaeological projects to commodification and much, much more. We have viewing guides available to make these materials more readily useful for educators. We have a series of fact sheets that are you know, two-page um, information sheets that give you, whether it's you, the student, whether you, the community member, or you, the public, what you should know about you know, a variety of topics, whether it be DNA, whether it be traditional knowledge, and so on. So that's a little bit about the iPinch project, but I want to move on now to another topic. And that is the challenges of indigenous heritage protection in the real world. And this is something that is a slow, sometimes frustrating, should I say sometimes, usually frustrating exercise. And here I'm looking at British Columbia. And what's interesting about British Columbia is that, first of all, the indigenous peoples whom we call First Nations there are very much a part of the landscape. They are very much a part of the political process, whether it be in terms of uh, educational challenges or uh, treaty rights and much more. And the history of relations between uh, archaeologists, between indigenous peoples, between the government, 
has changed dramatically in some cases over time, but it's also um, sometimes two steps forward, one step back as we move forward. And here's one example. So in the early 1990s, there was a very famous land claims uh, with the Gitsan Wet'suwet'en, uh, known as Delgamuk. And the first case was dismissed by Judge McEachern. And in his final judgment, he pointed out that the Gitsan Wet'suwet'en had no economy, and that also the pre-contact life for them was nasty, brutish, and short. And when I first read that, I was taken aback. And the first thing that came to me was first that this guy has never had an anthropology course in his life. And secondly, what planet has this guy been on for the last you know, 350 years? Because this comes out of Thomas Hobbes. And one would think that we've learned a lot about human diversity and, and other cultures between Hobbes' time and the present, but obviously Judge McEachern didn't. Um, fortunately, Delgmuk uh, went to trial again, and they were successful. But even more um, important in, in some ways is this, in terms of a progressive uh, change in Canada. In, 2014, the Supreme Court of Canada um, set down the, what's known as the Flacone decision. And in this landmark decision, they awarded um, Aboriginal title to the Chilcotin. This has never, ever been done before. And this has huge implications for not only British Columbia, but for all of Canada. And it'll be some time before we see what happens. But what's important here, I'm sorry, is, is two things. One is that the Jocotin, over the last few years, had been consulting with one of our IPINCH sponsored projects, and that was the Shequemic Territorial Authority project. And this project went forth on the premise of what does Shequemic heritage look like if the Shequemic had full control over their territory. So their discussions with the Jocotin helped move forward the uh, Chilcotin claim, which ultimately was successful in court. But what is important about the Chilcotin decision itself is that it makes one important change, and that is going from consultation, which has been the norm, has been the legal requirement in Canada, especially in British Columbia. You have to consult with First Nations. But the problem there is that often this happens so late in the process that their input has had very little effect. But with the Chilco decision, this changes it to consent, and that is a night and day difference. But again, this currently only holds to the Chilco, but I think there's going to be a trickle-down effect coming in the future. But here's another example. So those were some uh, instances of both progress and setbacks and progress again. But here are some of the outstanding issues. And this is the case of Grace Islet in coastal British Columbia. This is a one hectare islet, as you see here in the foreground. This is a recorded archaeological site with 16 burial cairns on it. And somehow, the islet was sold, and a person was allowed to start building a house, as you see here. And this caused a massive reaction among First Nations and their allies. The landowner was able to get around the Heritage Act by coming up with a plan by which the burial cairns would not be physically disturbed, they would be built around, which is a rather odd way and a very disrespectful way of protecting a burial cairn. As it happened in November 2015, we had a major eye pinch meeting in, in Vancouver. And much of our discussion at that meeting focused on the fact that we've been looking around the world with indigenous issues, but we need to work in our own backyard. And looking at Grace Islet, we crafted what becomes known as the eye pinch declaration or the declaration of the safeguarding of indigenous ancestral burial grounds as sacred sites and cultural landscapes. And this was a very clear statement in terms of 
why sacred sites, why burial grounds, why uh, cultural landscapes are so important, why they need to be preserved. None of this is new, none of this is radical. And we end with this, this request of, of, of respectfully calling on the federal and provincial governments, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to act immediately to protect not only Grace Island, but other places. And I'm not gonna read this all to you, you can find it on the iPinch website. But what is important here is that we were simply pointing out the existing legal and ethical obligations that all of these entities already had. We were not calling for revolution, we were simply reminding people, this is how you say you are going to be acting. Please act this way. Uh, we received um, both personal and organizational endorsements uh, for the declaration, and these are just some of the uh, organizational endorsements, including the two largest organizations, uh, the American Anthropological uh, Association, the largest organization of anthropologists in the world, and the Society for American Archaeology, plus many others. Four months later, the Grace Islet uh, controversy was resolved when the province bought Grace Islet with funds in part provided by the Nature Conservancy. And this was done to the satisfaction of the local First Nations. But what has often gone unnoticed is this, that the landowner received $5.45 million as a settlement, of which uh, $840,000 was for the land and the rest for losses suffered. Has anyone ever asked the local First Nations the losses that they've suffered at the disrespectful treatment of their sacred ground, their burial grounds? And that is often uh, you know, gone unnoticed. So let me start to pull this together now. There's been, for the last decade or so, a big move towards reconciliation um, in Canada, to a degree in the United States, um, in Australia and elsewhere. And this is very much at the heart of, of uh, what's going on in British Columbia. The problem is that reconciliation has to mean more than simply saying, we're sorry. It means changing fundamentally how you do things so that these problems don't occur again. And so even though politicians in British Columbia at the provincial and national level are calling for reconciliation, there's still a long way to go. Canada, for example, is a signatory for the United Nations uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and yet it is not going to be any time soon before the obligations laid out under UNDRIP are brought into action at the provincial level or federal level. The second is there needs to be the acknowledgement that protection of and access to one's own heritage is a basic human right. And this is, in fact, already stated in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. A third is that all of the dead must be given equal respect under the law. And that is not the case in British Columbia. After 1846, human remains are covered by the Cemeteries Act. Before 1846, they are basically treated as archaeological specimens. So you have a, a, a race-based notion of protection, which is, is untenable. Fourth is that the intentional destruction or denigration of, of burial grounds and other sacred or important places can be construed as a kind of violence. And this is not to you know, suggest that uh, you know, the, the loss of an archaeological site or burial site is more important than violence on living persons, but it is a kind of violence because it does threaten uh, individuals and communities' well-being and, and so on. So we need to reconcile heritage. We need to move beyond some of the limitations, some of the challenges that I pointed out. And this is difficult but it's something that all of us have a stake in, whether we are indigenous or not, because at some point or another, all of our lives will intersect with indigenous heritage in some manner, whether it be um, 
uh, you know, a movie in which indigenous heritage is, is presented in a way that's harmful to the indigenous peoples. And a great example here is Mel Gibson's Apocalypto. Uh, many of you have likely seen it. Um, Mel Gibson was uh, apprised that many Maya communities were incensed by his insensitive portrayal of them. And his reaction was a rather insensitive two-word Anglo-Saxon expletive. He, Mel Gibson does not get it. But that's the kind of thing that we need to be aware of in terms of the products that we buy, for example, the choices we make as consumers. Now, this is difficult. Uh, how do we go about doing this in a good way? And for myself, I've made many mistakes as I've tried to weave my way through the politics and the different worldviews of the people's lives that I have been uh, involved with in some manner. And this is something I've learned, that you will always make mistakes. And if you're not making enough, if you're not making mistakes, you know, you're really not trying hard enough. Um, but the th important thing here is we have to learn from our mistakes so we don't keep making them. And that's how one really becomes a good human being. So let me wrap this up with these points that sort of culminate everything that I've learned in the last 30 years of working with indigenous peoples. And the first is this, that heritage isn't just about things. And this is something I've, I've already spoken to today. We're looking at objects being just one part of a larger framework of relationships, of histories, and, and so on that are Embedded, embedded in an object, but that bring that object into the lives of um, the, the people who, who made the person who made it, who used it, and their ancestors. The second, heritage isn't limited to the past. And here we have a young Moriori girl with her living ancestor. That's not my worldview, but that's hers, and I've got to respect that worldview, even though it's radically different from my own. A third is that heritage permeates the fabric of indigenous societies. And what I mean by that is in many societies, indigenous societies, heritage does not exist as a concept. Because heritage, what we call heritage, is simply part of that fabric of their lives. And they don't differentiate it as being anything else than what is part of their everyday life. Heritage is mostly intangible. You know, yes, we have the thing, but we have the stories, we have the information, we have everything else that goes with it. And even for, you know, the most prestigious kind of, of artifact that we can find as archaeologists, you know, uh, a 15,000-year-old projectile point, that's simply a piece of stone. And that stone only has value based on the meaning that we ascribe to it. That is the intangible qualities that we give to it. Heritage research may have unintended consequences. And you see this here with this DNA helix. And uh, this is an illustration I put together for an article some time ago. And you see that each of those elements of the helix refers to a potential concern relating to DNA and identity, whether it be um, informed consent, whether it be issues of ownership, whether it be uh, data access, a research protocol, scientific colonialism, and so on. And then finally, heritage needs to be managed by those people whose heritage it is. How can anyone who's an outsider make informed decisions about the value, about the meaning of someone else's heritage? So those are the six most important things that I've learned during my career. And I'll just leave you with this. Uh, this is a very important statement to me from Wang Yang Ming. Um, a Chinese philosopher and statesman, but knowledge without action isn't real knowledge. And I find that as something that's really a guiding principle for me, that you know, I can learn everything there is to learn about the archaeology of a particular person or a particular group, rather, but I'm then the primary beneficiary unless I do something with that knowledge that matters to other people, most especially to the descendants of those people. Thank you. Thank you.